How many of us could testify this morning that God's been good? How many of us could testify this morning that, you know, life hasn't always gone the way we planned, but God's always been good? How many of us, now come on church, you're back in church, you're not at home sitting in your PJs sipping coffee, all right? So, so I can see, I can see you now when, when, when you yawn or you, you fall over or you, you fight with your brother. Or you sit. Come on, church. How many of us can testify this morning that God is always good? Amen? Amen. 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 This morning, I want to speak a little bit to that. And I want to speak to right where we are. I want to speak to right where you are. Because the reality is, as we come back together this morning, it has been over two months since we have openly congregated together. And I'm going to tell you where we are outwardly it is still a far cry from where we want to be. You watch people greet each other this morning and it's, people start like that and then they look embarrassed so they, they kind of go like that and then they end up just kind of saluting each other. Nobody really knows what to do. Half of you can't sit in your right pew because it's been roped off. And I know, I know it took every fiber of your self-control not to unhook that rope and sit in your spot. But I appreciate that, okay? I tell you, it's good to be back together, but we are outwardly still a far cry from where we want to be, where we wish we were. And so much has changed. So much is still in flux. And it really is crazy disorienting. How many of you can identify this morning with the idea that you've called Monday, Thursday? And you called April, June. And you've lost all sense of time and reality. So much has changed. But this morning, this morning, I'd like to speak to you from the Word of God about that which never changes. This morning, I want to speak to you for a few minutes from God's Word on the core of who we are as Christians, on, on the core of our call. I want to speak to you this morning about who we are in any circumstance. And This morning, I want to lay out, if we could, what we, by God's grace, will do no matter what comes next. And that is simply this, stick with Jesus. You look at Luke chapter 8, by the way, Luke chapter 8 was a part of your journey with Jesus this week, and I hope that you have been able to, uh, to, to engage in that and take part in that. It still is creating many, many interesting conversations in my house, um, but uh, Luke chapter 8, beginning in verse number 22, we find this, the Bible says, now it came to pass on a certain day that he went into a ship with his disciples. And he said unto them, let us go over into the other side of the lake. And they launched forth. I want you to notice, first of all, if you would, as we consider this idea of just stick with Jesus for your direction. For your direction in life, just stick with Jesus. You notice in verse 22 that, that there was a call received, that Jesus spoke unto his disciples, and he told them uh, to, to, to go over into the other side of the lake, to launch forth, and to go over into the other side. And so we see here a call received from the master. And I want to start this morning by reminding us this, that there are many, many voices out there in the world that demand your attention. You consider the, the landscape that we live in today. You consider the social media that we see today. You consider the news that's, that's constantly, almost oppressively thrust upon us today. And there are so many voices that are just demanding that, that we hear them. So many voices that are demanding that we believe them. So many voices that are demanding that we follow them. And if you think it's intense now, just wait until the conventions are over. And we have a full-blown presidential race on our hands. There are a lot of voices out there. You know, you consider this, not only are there voices out there in the culture, but voices out there in the name of religion, in the name of tradition, in our, in our friends, in our families. There are so many voices out there that demand to be heard, that demand to be listened to, that demand to be followed. Here's what we've got to understand. That his voice... Jesus' voice is the one that matters 
most of all. I'm going to tell you, there are some here this morning who've never heard his voice, who've never accepted his call. This morning, if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, what you need to hear this morning from him is that he so God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Would you hear this morning that though the wages of sin is death, that the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And there are some listening this morning who, who have never really registered his voice, who've never really answered his call. But I want you to know this morning that the Master is calling to you, calling to you to come and to receive him as your Savior. Don't miss him this morning. I tell you what you find if you read through the scriptures is when it comes to your standing before God, some people think that they can't come to God because of all the things they've done. You know what, ladies and gentlemen? We can come to God because of all he's done on our behalf. And this morning, let's get our eyes off of who we were, who we are, what we think. And, and beloved, this morning, if you've never received Jesus Christ, this morning, would you see what he's done for you on the cross of Calvary? Would you hear his voice? Would you come to him? So many voices out there. And yet we hear a voice, the voice of the master. You know, I'll tell you, even amongst believers, there are many wondering right now, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Or, or what are we going to do if? You know, I'll tell you this morning, what would be the best thing for us to do is to quiet our souls and just listen to him. You know, the Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews, chapter number one, in verses one and two, that God, who at sundry times and in divers' manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom he also made the worlds. This morning, the best thing that we could ever do would be to quiet our hearts to tune out the news and to tune out this and to tune out the what ifs and the what might be and the what could be and to just tune our hearts in. Because the reality is this, is Jesus is calling. Jesus is speaking. Are you listening? Are you listening? And so we see a call received. But I want you to also note the committed response. Because the call from the master, if you'll notice in Luke chapter 8 and verse number 22, was a call for movement. You read through these portions and what you'll find is that Jesus had been teaching for quite a while. That he had been giving parables and things of, of that nature. And, and, and I, th I tell you what, I think it's great to come and to, to hear the words of God. To listen to sermons and scriptures and stories. But, but the reality is, is that the call from the master will oftentimes be for movement. Because we're not here just to sit and listen. We're here to get up and go do something with it. I'm going to tell you, the call from the master didn't make a lot of sense. You look at the context, and, and Jesus' ministry is going really, really well. If Jesus was a modern-day evangelist, he would have set up a 10, a 15, a 30, a 60-day revival and just, and just run the momentum. Because, I mean, the multitudes were coming. The people were hungry. They were following in him. His needs were being met. And, and all of that was coming together. You want to talk about a revival? Jesus and them were experiencing a revival of sorts in Luke chapter 8. And yet in the midst of all of this, in the midst of the place of abundance, Jesus called them to leave without assurances. You know, if it were you or I, we would have asked a lot of questions. Jesus, where are we going? Jesus, who are we going with? Jesus, how long is it going to take for us to get there? Jesus, will there be snacks? Gluten-free options? <laughs> Jesus? But you know, the disciples, from what we see in Scripture, receive the call with a committed response.
It didn't make a lot of sense, but, but what you come to understand as you live this Christian life is that it might not make a lot of sense. And to be quite honest, as kindly as I can, it doesn't have to make a lot of sense to you. And it doesn't have to make a lot of sense to me. The Bible teaches us in Hebrews 11 in verse number 6 that without faith it is impossible to please him. You know, you look at Hebrews chapter 11 and that whole chapter is a chapter of God asking people to do things and God promising people things that don't make a lot of sense. Abraham, get up and leave your father and your mother and your country and your kindred. Where are we going, Lord? I'll show you. Abraham says, okay, let's go. I tell you, that didn't make a lot of sense. God promising Abraham and Sarah very late in life that they would have a child and that child would come from Sarah. I, I can see it now. Abraham comes home and he, he, he goes over with Sarah, that which God has told him. And, and Sarah says, Abraham, don't you realize how old I am? Abraham says, I believe this is a trap. didn't make a lot of sense, but it didn't need to to us. When, it, when God told Abraham, Abraham, I want you to sacrifice your son, your only son, Isaac. But Lord, he's the one that the promises are going to come through. I know, but sacrifice him. Didn't make a lot of sense. And you read that whole chapter over and over and over again. Joshua and the Israelites in the battle of Jericho. Okay, Lord, how are we going to win this? Well, you're going to march around the city. Now what? Flaming arrows, battering rams? No, go to bed. Wake up and march again. Okay. Now do we get the cannons? No? Go to bed, wake up and do it again? Okay. Over and over and over and over. Didn't make a lot of sense. But you know what you find the more you follow the master? You know what you find the more direction he gives you? Is it doesn't have to make a lot of sense to you because my God knows what he's doing. Because my God he knows the beginning from the end and he knows where he's taking us. He knows what he's doing. By the way, unless you think God is cruel for asking you to do things that you don't quite understand, for calling you to live a life that, that doesn't always make sense to you, remember this, that you ask that of your kids or you one day asked that of your kids and grandkids to receive your direction without total understanding sometimes. How many parents have had conversations with their kids? Get away from the road. The kid goes, why? Why? Now, how many of you parents said, oh, I've been waiting for this for four years. Sit down, Johnny. Let me tell you. Well, you see, Johnny, you weigh 45 pounds. And, and, and what you need to understand, Johnny, is that even here in town, the cars that come around this curve are generally doing at least 35 pounds. Now, even though cars are generally mostly made of plastic these days, they still weigh roughly 837 pounds. So if you take 837 pounds and, and, and begin to factor in the momentum that it would carry uh, uh, going 35 to 40 miles per hour and then compare that to, to the amount of uh, force that you would be able to provide at, at a 45 pound uh, young person. You see Johnny, when that car, how many of us sat down and gave a physics lecture to our child? We say, do it because I said so. Because we know that where they are right now, there is no way that they can understand it. No way. And you know what? Sometimes God comes and God will speak to us and he will call us. Maybe it's away from a place of abundance. Maybe he calls us in a direction without any assurances. And you know what? We don't understand it and we don't see how it works out and we don't know how it makes sense. But the reality is, is that my God knows what he's doing. And the Bible still says, Psalm 37 and verse 23, that the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And this morning, here's the call for your direction, whatever comes next, just stick with Jesus. Just stick with Jesus. And so we see for your direction. Look how the account continues. Verse number 23, the Bible says this, but as they sailed, he fell asleep. 
And there came down a storm of wind on the lake, and they were filled with water and were in jeopardy. And they came to him and awoke him, saying, Master, Master, we perish. And he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water, and they ceased, and there was a calm. So as we consider this idea of just stick with Jesus, number one, for your direction, just stick with Jesus. And by the way, if there are some here this morning who feel they don't have a lot of direction right now in their life, I'm going to tell you there's nothing better that you can do than to just seek Jesus with all you are, to get into his word, to bow before him in prayer, and just seek him for your direction. So we see for your direction, but also for your development, for your development. We see the disciples here in verses 23 and 24. And as they followed the Lord, they wound up in a pretty intense storm. You know, it reminds us this, that Christ on board doesn't guarantee smooth passage. That good people go through painful times. You look at the disciples and you realize that what they experienced was painful. What they were experiencing was personal. And I'll remind you, you read through the book of Luke and the disciples had already seen some crazy stuff. They had already seen Jesus work some marvelous miracles. Things that were just unbelievable. But what made the difference right here is that what they were going through was now unbelievably personal. It was them. It was them. They who were in dire need of Jesus. How many of us know sometimes this life can be painful? How many of us know sometimes this life and the things that that, that we experience can feel incredibly personal? I'll tell you this, and I'll explain it in a minute. It has to be. Now, let me give you a little bit of assurance that that it's not wrong. I don't believe that it's wrong for you and I to ask why. So long as we are ready and willing to accept the answer that's given to us, even if we don't like it or understand it, And to justify that, I say even Jesus on the cross asked, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It's painful. It's personal. And if you're anything like me, if you're anything like the disciples, you struggle with that. You know, the disciples do exactly what did exactly what I do. Look what they say when they run to Jesus in in verse number 24. They say, Master, Master, uh, we perish. Lord, we're dying. In a parallel passage in the book of Mark, they go so far as to say, don't you care? Don't you even care what we're going through? How many of us have been there? Where in the depths of our hearts, we may never verbalize it, but in the depths of our hearts, it is so painful and it is so personal that we wonder if God even cares. But you know what really encourages me this morning as you look at Jesus and you look at this scenario is is the reality of this. Jesus never promises protection from pain. No, no, rather, he he told us that in the world we would have tribulation. Jesus doesn't promise us protection from pain, but he does assure us of his presence and his purpose through pain. And this is the truth this morning that many of us need to latch on to in this day. It may be intense, but it is intentional from the loving hand of your heavenly Father. You look at Jesus in the boat, where was Jesus? Verse 23 tells us he was asleep. Now, Jesus was asleep. Why was Jesus asleep? Did Jesus not know the storm was coming? No, Jesus knew the storm was coming. Jesus might not have had your weather app, 
he might not have had the weather channel. But Jesus, the Son of God, knew the storm was coming. So then, why would Jesus, who knew the storm was coming, a storm that would fill the vessel, why would Jesus, who loved his disciples and wanted to help his disciples, why would Jesus go to sleep? Well, I'll tell you one reason. Because Jesus, he wasn't worried about it. Jesus wasn't caught off guard. Jesus knew that he was taking them somewhere. Jesus knew that he was building them into something. And here it is, growth comes when things get painful. That the greatest growth will come when things get personal. I think about this, I think about growing pains. I got one of my kids who like forever has growing pains. Mama, 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 my legs hurt. My legs hurt. Oh. Well, sweetie, that just means you're growing. And that's a good thing. You think about, boy, I'm excited. I'm excited. A week from Tuesday, the gym's open. I can go, I can go bike or jog or do whatever. I, I can go back to the gym. Woo but you know the whole point of training, if you've done any training, be it running or lifting or anywhere in between, the whole point of training is to break your body down so you build it back stronger. I think about this. So many parents got that crash course in homeschool this year. I tell you what, this country has a new respect for homeschool families. Amen, glory, hallelujah. <laughs> Woo. But you know what? There's a reason that when your kid comes home with Algebra 1, and I just don't get it. When am I ever going to use this? I can't do this. You know what? When our kid comes home and they struggle, maybe it's writing. Uh, we struggle with writing. I think it's hereditary, but we struggle with that in my household. It's so hard. No, it's not. Just write the word twice. I can't do it. And we struggle and we struggle and we struggle. You can do it. Why? Why do we put our kids through that? Why don't we just say, baby, it's okay. You can drop out in the fifth grade. Mommy will take care of you forever. Why don't we say that? Because we know, even if they never use algebra again, that the struggle will make them stronger. And some of us want God to say, it's okay, you can drop out right where you are and daddy will... No, 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 God is taking you somewhere. God is building you into something. And ladies and gentlemen, the intense pain and, and, and that we experience in the trials and the troubles, it is God's intentional development of our lives. I'm gonna tell you, Jesus' whole purpose for crossing that day was not for the disciples to be overcome, but that they might learn to become overcomers. That's why Jesus tells us in Roman, and Paul writes in Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 35, he said, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? He says, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. No. No. Nay. In all these things. That's the famine. That's the pestilence. That's the distress. That's whatever slaughter may come physically. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. What Jesus said in John 16 in verse number 33, that these things have I spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And I'm going to tell you what, right now it hurts. And there are some people who are struggling outwardly. There are some people who are struggling inwardly and what we are going through is wreaking havoc upon people with, with their emotions and, and elements of depression and things like that. It's wreaking havoc on people. But I'm going to tell you what, understand that in every storm we face, 
that Jesus is working to intentionally develop us, to grow us, to prepare us for what he has for us. And so here's the admonition. For your development, just stick with Jesus. Just stick with Jesus. For your direction, just stick with Jesus. For your development, just stick with Jesus. Look at verse 25. The Bible says this, And he said unto them, Where is your faith? And they, being afraid, wonder, saying one to another, What manner of a man is this? For he commandeth even the winds and the water, and they obey him. So we see for your direction, just stick with Jesus. For your development, just stick with Jesus. Finally this morning, for your destiny or your destination, just stick with Jesus. Do you know what happens through all of this? Jesus confronts the issue. He says, where is your faith? And it wasn't so much a harsh chastisement as it was calling them to a realization that, that, that they, they, they missed it in this area, that they failed in this area. And he was calling them to a developed trust. Because the promises of God are sure, amen? That what God has promised us, he will surely perform. And you consider just this little snippet, what had Jesus told them? That they were going to get into the boat and they were going to launch out. They were going to go to the other side. The other side. You know what wasn't on the itinerary that day? The bottom of the lake. The bottom of the lake. And Jesus was pointing out to his disciples, fellas, you can trust me. Fellas, you can trust me. Christian, you can trust me. The greatest danger that evening, the greatest danger that evening was not found in the fierceness around the disciples. The greatest danger that evening was not found in the fierceness around the disciples, but with the fear within them. You see, fear and faith cannot coexist. Fear and faith are, are the antithesis of one another. And how many of us, how many of us would be honest enough to say we battle fear on a pretty much regular, fairly regular basis? Fear of what could be. Fear of what I could catch. Fear of what I could give. Fear of, oh, this is a big one. Fear of what they might do fear and we let fear dictate our lives but fear of what could be will always keep you from the fullness of what he had called you to be Here's a big one. How many of us have experienced fear that life may never be the same again? That we might never get back to normal. I'll tell you, there, this is already, this situation has already created a far deeper and longer lasting consequences than I ever dreamed it would. We had, a, we had a big family vacation planned this summer that's probably gone. We were going to go to the most magical place on earth. <laughs> but realize, even if we went, probably pictures with masked princesses <laughs> wasn't really worth what they were asking. <laughs> but what if life never gets back to normal again? What if I always have to wait in line at Home Depot? What if they always make me vote by mail? What if I never get my pew back? Amen. 
You know, the greatest danger we face is not a disease around us. It's the doubt within us. And you know what the Lord was calling the disciples to here? He was calling them to a developed trust. Because once you decide that Jesus is worthy of your trust, once you decide, you know what? It doesn't matter what I face. He's got this. Once you decide that truly all power is given unto him in heaven and in earth, once you decide that, that from birth to death and for eternity to come, that he has it all covered once you decide that he is worthy of your trust, I'm going to tell you what will happen. You'll stop looking over your shoulder back at some normal you think you created and you will gladly, with anticipation, press forward, craving whatever he has for you next because you know whatever comes, he's got it. Amen. That full and innocent trust like that child that just knows no matter what comes, daddy's got this covered. No matter what comes, mama's got this covered. A developed trust. And with this trust, you know what we find? We find what Jesus had in store, and that was a triumph. You know, often with good intention, we say that God will not give you more than you can handle. I don't think that's entirely true. I think we see many instances where God gives us way more than we can handle. Because you know the point of this life is, is not for us to find out how much we can handle, but how much He can handle. When He got up and stilled the waves, they didn't say, Wow, Peter, way to go. If you hadn't rowed us to this point, buddy, we'd have been lost. They didn't say, John, thank you so much for your encouraging words. John, if you hadn't been there cheering us on... I don't know what would have happened. They didn't say, Judas, buddy, I don't know how you did it, you old sneaky man, but you got to done this. No, no, no. What'd they say? They said, what manner of man is this? That even the wind and the waves obey him. You know, the whole passage of this, the whole theme of this passage is victory. Because you see, when they crossed over and, they, and, and they, they saw victory over the deep, you know what they find next? They, they find a, a, a maniac, a demon-possessed man there of Gadara. A, a man who had legion of demons within him. Now, okay, okay. Think with me now, all right? Yeah, storms are scary. But you got a demon-possessed guy who runs around naked snapping chains? That's pretty scary too. Like, I'm thinking, where are those winds and waves? And yet, you know what they saw? Jesus not only triumphed over the deep, Jesus triumphs over the demonic. You know, they go a little farther, and you know what they find? They find a lady who had a, who had a physical issue, and she had had a physical issue for years and years and years. And the Bible says she would spent all her money on physicians, and nobody could help her. Boy, what a desperate situation. How many times I've sat in my office with somebody, and you know what? Other than listen and pray, there was nothing, nothing, nothing that I could immediately do to make their situation better. But you know what the disciples found? That not only did Jesus triumph over the deep, and not only did Jesus triumph over the demonic, but Jesus triumphs over disease. They went a little further in that same chapter. There was a little girl who had died. And the mother and the father had besought Jesus, saying, Jesus, 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 would you come and would you heal our daughter? And, and, and we see that, that on the way that the little girl died. She died. If ever there was a, a hopeless situation, it was that. I mean, the disciples had almost perished. And the, 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 the demon-possessed man, yeah, he was in a bad way. And the woman, she was dying. But this little girl was dead. And yet when Jesus showed up, he not only proved that he triumphed over the deep, and that he triumphed over the demonic, and that he triumphed, over disease, but that he had all power over death. 
The whole theme of this passage is victory. You know what God has ordained the theme of the Christian life to be? God has ordained the theme of the Christian life to be victory in Christ. And whether it's COVID-19, whether it's cancer, whether it's diabetes, whether it's cardiac arrest, whether it's addiction, whether it's demonic oppression, whether it's bitterness and unforgiveness, to understand that in Christ we are equipped to overcome because greater is he that is in us than he that is in this world. We are called not to just survive this life, but to thrive in this life. For the Christians, this, this triumph, there's, there's no circling the wagons, there's no backing down, there's, there's no retreats, there's no regrets. Triumph and trust is our destiny. And for your destiny, just stick with Jesus. Hey, the core of our Christian life, church, the core is simply that, to stick with Jesus, to follow him no matter what. It's universal. We are all at some stage of this journey. Can I say this in closing this morning to those who have never trusted Jesus Christ? You're here this morning, you're watching by way of Facebook, listening by way of radio, and you have never trusted Jesus Christ. I beg of you this morning to hear because it is so important that you know where you stand with God before you stand before Him. And this morning, if you were to die without Christ in love, let me tell you, if you were to die without Christ, that the boat of your life would sink and be eternally lost. Separated from God in a place called hell for all eternity. But praise God, you don't have to go there. This morning, if you've never trusted Christ, could I implore you to hear His call. The call of that for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. This morning, if you hear him calling, I implore of you to come. We'll have somebody take the scriptures and show you how you can know for sure that if you died today, you'd go to heaven. And to the church, church, would you listen to me? Church, would you listen to me? Don't miss what God is doing. You go back to Luke chapter 8 and verse number 22 and what you're going to find is you're going to find a whole lot of people in that revival who never saw the victory over the deep, who never saw the victory over the demonic, who never saw victory over disease, who never saw victory over death because they never got on the boat. I'm going to tell you, Jesus is directing this morning. Sir, do you hear him? Ma'am, do you hear him? He's speaking. For your direction, would you stick with Jesus? I'll tell you this morning, Jesus is developing believers. There are some of you who are in the midst of the fiery furnace and you are struggling and it's painful and it's personal and you don't really know what to do with it. Would you trust him with it? Recognize that we don't always have to understand. Just be grateful we have the opportunity to watch him work. Hey, Jesus this morning is not necessarily looking for somebody to step up. Jesus this morning is not necessarily looking for somebody who will, who will step in. Jesus is looking this morning for somebody who will simply stick with him no matter what. And when you look at it that way, sticking with Jesus is not just an option. Sticking with Jesus is the only valid option for you and I. Could we stand together this morning with our heads bowed and our eyes closed?